Each week, the Bible as Literature podcast brings you in-depth discussion of the biblical text in a format short enough for the morning commute, but long enough to be substantive, posing difficult questions meant to keep you engaged. If you value this work, please consider donating as little as 25 cents per episode. That's just $1 per month. To learn more, please visit patreon.com forward slash Bible. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Bible. Thank you. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. As in the story of Genesis, for each generation of Luke's genealogy, the functional names outline the literary framework of a recurring biblical dilemma. Without God's perpetual intervention, life from age to age is impossible. In science and engineering, numerous terms are used to describe similar mechanisms. In physics and thermodynamics, it is referred to as external energy input or external work. In biological systems, which require food, water, and other resources, it is called homeostasis. Even artificial intelligence requires external input in order to work correctly. Though the analogy is not precise, you get the point. In these examples, external input is necessary to prevent catastrophic failure. In the literary reality of the Bible, like a plant without light or water, or an iPhone sitting on the shelf in 1905, each generation of human beings degrades and fails rapidly to the extent that without God's intervention there is no possibility of life. In the most obvious of all biblical examples, God intervenes to make a baby when Abraham's seed fails. As far as the Bible is concerned, nothing helpful is passed down from Adam or Abraham let alone your grandparents or parents. This also means that you, like your forebears, have nothing valuable of yourself to pass on. Why? Because your origin and your birth are from the land of the Canaanite. Your father was an Amorite and your mother a Hittite. So if the heritage that gets us out from under the boot of Herod does not come from your family, and the inheritance in question is not from your line, where is it, what is it, where does it come from, and who is its beneficiary? Richard and I discuss the Gospel of Luke, chapter 3, verse 30. You're listening to the Bible as literature. Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos. And this is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to episode 484 of the Bible as Literature podcast. There are pluses and minuses to coming from a big family. The great thing about coming from a big family is when you go somewhere and you all meet up, you don't need to worry about who's going to take care of the kids at a gathering. There's lots of life and enjoyment at parties. It's nice to see everybody. That is, if people aren't squabbling and behaving like two-year-olds, which is what happens in village life. But I would still take the village over American individualism every day of the week. <laughs> of course, when you mix the village with American individualism, it becomes toxic. But that's for another episode, Dr. Benton. In any case, that's the benefit of coming from a big family, of living in the village. That is the wonder of life outside of the United States, outside of Western Europe. That's how human beings used to live before the rise of the industrial age and mechanization and the triumph of the city over normal life. 
But there was a huge problem with tribalism because, after all, it's tribalism, Rich, that evolved into patriarchy, kingship, and the city. So nothing is without its toxicity. Nothing is without its problems. It's only shepherdism that's blessed by scripture because shepherdism never settles down in one place. It keeps moving and it has its gatherings, but then it picks up and moves. It doesn't build anything. It doesn't leave any structure behind. There's no time to squabble because whatever you might squabble over leaves no traces. The family, like any institution, doesn't want to drop everything and move on like the shepherd of flock. It doesn't want to go graze somewhere else. It doesn't want to move from oasis to oasis. It wants to preserve itself. It can't accept Paul's admonition in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 that if someone in the tribe messes up, you should hand them over to Satan. It can't tolerate that instruction because that's not good for the tribe. We should do what everyone advises us to do. We should baby everyone in the tribe. We should manipulate everyone in the tribe. We should whisper sweet nothings to everyone in the tribe so that the tribe will stay fat, dumb, and happy. So the tribe increases without wisdom. How does it increase? Not in the spirit. It becomes puffed up in the flesh, which is what Paul is attacking in 1 Corinthians. Everyone thinks that they're growing in the spirit, but they are fat, dumb, and happy in the flesh, walking around as though they are already raised from the dead. Bad news. Sounds very much like American Christianity. That is what naturally happens with tribalism. And of course, we're hearing the Lucan genealogy and we're hearing about all of these kings and how they go nowhere. And suddenly, Rich, we stumble across these tribal names. And you would imagine, oh, family first. Isn't it a relief? We're not talking about kings. We're talking about the people. No, friends. Because the kings come from somewhere. The kings come from this same mentality, the inevitability of a Herod coming from a human line. And what you're talking about as far as a tribe, it's so relevant to this genealogy because in a hunter-gatherer society, I even think I don't know hunter-gatherers myself, so I'm going to imagine. The idea of continuation and furtherance of the tribe, I don't think this is how a hunter-gatherer thinks. For a hunter-gatherer tribe, you have to bring in a certain number of calories to the tribe and distribute those calories among the people or people start to die. That's the furtherance of the tribe is making sure that no one here dies of starvation. Let's just start with that. The future of the tribe is something that becomes much more abstract. And it's when we talk about the furtherance in the future and these sorts of things that we start coming up with very odd things. Now in Hebrews, there is discussion, I'm talking a lot about Hebrews 11 and 12, about the promise, about this kingdom and being a member of the kingdom of the heavens, but you have to stick to this promise. Sticking with the gospel offers a promise. Sticking to the law of Sinai offers the promised land. You stick with the law and then there's the promise ahead. But the tribe, what does it promise? That we'll just keep going and keep doing the same thing and not dying. That's the promise. We'll just continue to not die. Great. But in this way that is wise, there's this perpetual kingdom of Zion, of the heavenly Jerusalem, that is God's purview. This is the thing that rests outside of the purview of humanity. That's why God has to replace human Herod with his son, Jesus. With the tribe, there's this promise that if we perpetuate ourselves, things will be good. But that's not necessarily true because it doesn't follow the wisdom that Torah offers, that God offers in his teaching, the difficult teaching. Now, the tribe says it's not about your ego, it's about the tribe. 
And the kingdom of heaven says it's not about your ego, it's about the kingdom. But the promise is something greater than what Herod offers, than what the tribe offers. This is what is being laid out in Hebrews, and that's what's laid out in Luke to Theophilus, that there's something bigger going on here, that there's a way of transcending this Herod and the tribes and the Herods of this world, the inevitable result of these genealogies. We need to be listening in Luke to the promise that's being offered, both the promise that's being offered of following the tribe and the promise that's being offered by following the one whom God declared is his son. The son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonam, the son of Eliakim. When I hear these names, Richard, these are names that are easy to explain. They're familiar names. The roots are not obscure. These are tribal names that should be familiar to our listeners if they've been hearing scripture at all these past few years, hearing the text with us. But what jumps out at me is that although this text, Luke, is addressed to the nations, remember in scripture you have the sons of Israel and the nations. This absurd notion that there is anything other than the sons of Israel and the nations. Like some people talk about some third category. It's the stupidest idea on the face of the earth. It's absurd and blasphemous, not only because it's anti-scriptural that the Christians are somehow a third category, but it's absurd because it's like saying that one plus one equals five or four or three. It's empirically stupid because Israel itself is one of the nations. It only stands apart because God used it to set an example. So what you have in Luke is this text being addressed to all the nations, using the sons of Israel as an example of sin, which we learn in Romans and elsewhere. And now these characters, these tribes, which God has held up as an example for the sake of all of the nations, names that would be familiar to an addressee of this text who's been hearing the story all along, suddenly draw Israel, the example of sin, these tribes, into this story of sin in the genealogy. It's very powerful. You want to think of Judah as good, and that's what Christians do today. I mean, everybody loves C.S. Lewis, the Lion of Judah, blah, blah, blah. Guess what? What comes out of the Lion of Judah? Herod. Knock yourself out, friends. The only reason Jesus ends up doing the right thing is because the Father interceded with his seed. That's the trick. Go back and hear Galatians. Judah didn't produce anything. But these names, which you think are positive, are underscoring the negative. I know we're a drag on the Bible as Literature podcast. We're so negative. We're so critical. We keep trying to explain that Scripture is satire. Scripture ultimately is positive because it's negative. Is that quotable, Rich? You can't put that on a quote because it doesn't sound lofty and philosophical. <laughs> but it's a fact. It's positive because it's negative about the human race. Yeah, I mean, the fact that Judah produced anything was only because he slept with his daughter-in-law <laughs> thinking that she was a prostitute. So, you know, we, whatever positivity you have for Judah and what he produced, realize that he also condemned his daughter-in-law because she was pregnant outside of wedlock with her father-in-law's son. So it gets complicated in the Bible. So if you want the Bible to be a positive story, you're going to have a lot of explaining to do, unfortunately. And that's what I think this verse is doing. Look, the last name in the last verse in verse 29 was Levi. Levi, Simeon, Judah, Joseph. I mean, does this sound familiar? These are all sons of Jacob. 
sons of Israel. The devil is in the details, literally in Scripture. So the next time you're chanting a Traparian in church and you see the word Judah, remember what Judah did. Judah is a character. Judah is a tribe. Judah is a function. Don't get excited. The Traparian can function correctly if you remember how nasty Judah was. Come on, people. You have to be familiar with the story. I mean, the son of Simeon, whose name means listen, but who listens to God? <laughs> Nobody hears the text. Joseph, he will add, this is the second appearance we've had of this name. We had this name in verse 23. He will continue. He will add. The thing keeps on going. Then once we have Yonam, which either comes from Yohanan, we've talked before how sometimes the final N in Hebrew can become an M in Greek. That's not a big deal. And the H doesn't appear in Greek. So that's how you go from Yohanan to Yonam. So that can either be Jonas or Yohanan, which is, again, the grace or the one who teaches or the dove. And El Yakim is God will raise, Yakim. So those are familiar with Arabic. It's the same root as Qam, as in Messiah Qam, El Yakim, God will raise. But then once you have these human tribes, the human tribes always go in the same direction. And Eliakim, the name appears elsewhere in 2 Kings 18, the head of the household of Hezekiah. So there's a royal connotation as well. So yes, God raises up, but once one is beholden to the tribe, God can't help anymore. Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are the ones who hear the word of the Lord and do it. And then he doesn't go and chase down and harangue his siblings and his mother to listen to the word of God and do it. He says, I've got enough on my plate right now. I've got a whole tribe I'm dealing with right now. So I'm busy. Busy with what? With teaching the word of the Lord so that people hear it and do it. This is the one whom God placed as his Herod replacement. Jesus is the one who says, I can't go with the bloodline as number one. I have to go with the word. And if people want to listen to the word, they're part of the tribe. Welcome. Anytime. Hear it, do it, you're in. Now, because these characters engage in these horrible behaviors, like the example you gave of Judah, despite how horrible they are, despite how horrible we are, don't make the mistake of thinking, oh my gosh, these are terrible people. We are terrible people. This is what everybody keeps missing. If God had mercy on them, lucky for you. Don't fall in the trap of all these arrogant people who read the Bible and say, no one should read this because the people are so terrible. No, we're terrible. So we should be thankful that our fathers were so rotten because we're worse and God still had mercy on them. Duh. The point is that God had mercy on each generation here and provided life for them. And when all is said and done, he provided mercy by raising the Lord Jesus so that this merciful seed of instruction would be available for all the nations for every generation until the end of the age. That is the power of the Gospel of Luke. That's the power of the name Eliakim. So this genealogy is central to the proclamation of the resurrection. This is a point worth hitting on over and over again because it is in a way tragic, Rich, how we dismiss the genealogy and thereby misunderstand or altogether ignore what is happening in the proclamation of the resurrection? In both the genealogies in Matthew and Luke, we have the genealogy of somebody who's not Jesus. This is very strange. If you're going to tell a story about Jesus, at least show Jesus' genealogy. But we show the genealogy of Jesus' father, Joseph, who's not Jesus' father. So why would both Matthew and Luke spend so much time doing this 
so that we could just skip it and get to the juicy parts. It's here for a reason. It's a weird genealogy. Any other genealogy is going to be the genealogy of your person. I mean, go read Homer. They're not going to give you the genealogy of the guy's uncle. They're going to give you the genealogy of the guy. That's the thing. Why do you go off track here? Because there is a teaching in this. The teaching is in the emptiness of human genealogy. Human genealogy does not end up with Jesus. Jesus is outside of this genealogy literarily, and he's declared directly by God's word that this is my son. He is the son of God in this sense that he is the inheritor of the kingdom. However many generations were born in between God creating the heavens and the earth and creating Adam and then Jesus, however many generations are in between, Jesus is the heir because he stands outside of this human lineage. Thanks very much, Dr. Benton. Thank you, Father. You've just heard the Bible as literature. Thanks for listening. The Bible as Literature is a production of the Ephesus School Network.